Okay, before we jump in where we left off uh, with innate immunity last time, uh, I want to revisit a few questions from our last exam. Uh, the ones that were most commonly missed. Interestingly enough, the ones that were most commonly missed on one form were slightly different than the ones most commonly missed on the other form. I don't know if it's just, you know, small sample size or the order that the questions were in. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I kind of just put together five of, uh, there was only five or six questions that less than half of you missed. This was the most common one missed, though, on both forms. Um, so what I was getting at is basically what, what does that term induction mean? Um, and there's only one answer that, that can be correct. That's when that bacteriophage DNA leaves the host cell chromosome and uh, basically starts uh, replicating in the, just the lytic replication. So it starts making more of itself assembly and then leaving that host cell. So that, that was uh, induction. Uh, which one of the following is generally the most susceptible to both chemical and physical microbial control methods? Uh, I think a number of you said you were trying to decide between these two answers. Uh, if you remember that little it wasn't a table really that there was one particular particular graphic uh, where of course prions were the most difficult to to kill uh, envelope viruses are generally the easiest one out in the environment that envelope is just degrades really quickly uh, remember covid is an envelope virus so it's, it's pretty wimpy in the environment um, should be easy to kill uh, viruses with this type of genome must carry with them the enzyme RNA dependent RNA polymerase in order to replicate that RNA genome. Uh, that is an enzyme that we do not have. We never make RNA from RNA. Okay, so this is uh, single stranded RNA viruses. Correct there. Uh, and sometimes we study all the details and then we kind of forget the big picture of the so what. Um, sulfur drugs interfere with bacteria's enzymes to make folic acid. Why do they need folic acid? Uh, it's a coenzyme that's necessary for uh, bacteria as well as our cells to make DNA, to make nucleic acid. Okay, so, of course, we get folic acid from our diet, so that SXT doesn't, it is selectively toxic. All right, so I've had a few of you stop by to look at that exam. You're still welcome to do that anytime. Uh, it's good to, to see what you missed. All right. Uh, all right, so we left off at kind of a uh, I don't know, kind of a difficult time where like smack dab in the middle of compliments. Uh, so let me just backtrack just a little bit, review just a little bit. We were talking about uh, most of the last lecture was our kind of what we consider our second line of defense, uh, part of innate immunity. Our first line of defense is kind of physical break barriers like skin or we might consider our normal microbiota uh, kind of our first line of defense. And then second line, we think of uh, all our white blood cells and the way, not all of them, but things like macrophages, uh, neutrophils, eosinophils. Uh, and we talk about phagocytosis um, and a little bit how a phagocytic cell 
understands that uh, a, some kind of pathogen is worthy of being phagocytized. We talked about those full like receptors on the outside of phagocytic cells that uh, recognize these broad based patterns that we call PAMPs, things like lipopolysaccharide or peptidoglycan, things that we wouldn't find on our cells. Uh, and then we started talking about these complement proteins. This is a, a cascade reaction. So one protein gets activated and acts on another protein to cleave it, which act on other proteins to cleave them. Uh, and then we talked about some of those fragments and the important role that they play, as well as how some of these proteins can come together to form this membrane uh, this MAC, this membrane attack complex. That's kind of where we ended with. So uh, I wanted to draw particular attention here uh, to some of these bits. Uh, the C3B acts as an opsonin. Remember that term? That means and anything that's an opsonin is going to increase the chances that our, our phagocytes will be successful at phagocytizing, phagocyt phagocytizing a pathogen. All right, so picture lots of C3B all over the outside of this bacterial cell, and that's going to make it easier for those pseudopods to grab a hold of that bacteria cell. Um, the C3A and C5A, those act to increase inflammation. We're going to talk about why that's important in just a minute. We'll talk about inflammation. Um, part of that, uh, as a result of increasing inflammation, it's going to increase chemotaxis of other cells to the area. So we'll talk about why that is. Um, okay, and, and these this the C5B, it, it binds back up here, along with C6, C7, C8, and lots of C9s to make that membrane attack complex. And, uh, you know, it takes lots of these membrane attack complexes to bring about the death of a cell. Uh, when I finished last time, this is more likely to impact gram negative bacteria. Um, it turns out that, that I was reading, sometimes I think of a question in my head and then I kind of go off on a tangent and it can stall me out for a long time. But it turns out complement just do doesn't just act on bacteria. Um, it can help uh, bring about the, the death and neutralize viral viruses as well. Uh, but we kind of think more in terms of this is especially important in, in fighting a bacterial pathogen. Okay, so those membrane attack complexes just aren't going to be able to poke through that thick peptidoglycan layer of gram positive cells. So, especially helpful, at least that aspect of complement. Uh, so, what we didn't get to last time, uh, we wanted to talk about the three different ways that uh, complement is activated. And I, I want to emphasize that it really doesn't matter which way these complement cascade gets activated, the result is the same. Okay, we're still gonna, you know, end up with membrane attack complexes and the C3B and the C5A, all those bits and the jobs that they're doing. Uh, we get that no matter how the whole ball gets rolling. Okay, so the three ways that uh, that complement cascade can begin. Uh, the first way, it, we call it the classical pathway because it was the first one that was discovered. Uh, but with the classical pathway, this is uh, activated uh, by an antigen and antibody complex. And I know we haven't talked specifically about antigens or specifically about antibodies yet. Stay tuned for that. Um, but that antigen antibody complex uh, is recognized by C1, and that, that causes the, the C1 to split the C2 and the C4, uh, like we talked about in the preceding graphic. Uh, with the alternative pathway, uh, this will say that it's activated by pathogens. Uh, the next graphic, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that, uh, hopefully explain that a little bit better. 
Uh, and with the lectin pathway, this is activated by microbial polysaccharides. Okay, and again, I'm going to illustrate that a little bit better. Um, this this YouTube video, I just wanted to include that in there. That that's just um, kind of a, a cute little summary of, of complements uh, and activate activation. It moves really fast, but it's only a couple of minutes long. So I thought it was pretty good. So I just wanted to include that there, but I'm not going to show it now because I don't have a very good way to get the sound out. But uh, look at that if you're interested. Uh, so the three activation pathways, this is your, your book's graphic here. Okay, like I said, the classical pathway involves an antibody here bound to some foreign substance. Okay, that's what we call an antigen. Uh, and that again starts the, the cleaving of, the, of those beginning complement proteins. With the alternative pathway, um, let me write a little bit over here. Um, it turns out that C3 is actually splitting by itself uh, just at a, at a really slow late rate all the time. Um, okay, so C3 is constantly splitting. Uh, at a low rate. Uh, and if those C3 fragments, if C3B in particular, happens to be in the close proximity of a, of a pathogen, usually a bacterial pathogen, it will bind to it. Uh, and then if there's some other proteins that happen to be in the area, which we're not going to get really specific about, your book says factors B, D, and P, don't memorize that, but there's also some other kind of checks that need to be boxes that need to be checked. Uh, so if things are just right, uh, that C3B will bind to the pathogen, and that will actually cause lots more C C3 to be split. So that begins the rest of, of the, the activation here. Um, if C3, if that C3 is, like I said, constantly being split at a low level, if there's no pathogen nearby, then it just degrades. Okay, but if, if there happens to be, so that's why we say it's activated by a pathogen, if, if again, it happens to be there. Uh, and then the lectin pathway involves uh, uh, lectins that we produce. These are proteins that we produce in the liver, uh, and they recognize a polysaccharide called mannose. Okay, remember, it ends in O-S-E, then you know it's a sugar. And this is a polysaccharide that's found very commonly on the surface of bacteria that we don't ever have on our cells. Okay, so it's kind of this broad-based pattern that we see on bacterial cells uh, and not on our cells. Uh, and if so when the lectins binds to that mannose, then that acts to cleave C3 and do that C3A and C3B. Yeah. Manos is a monosaccharide. Okay, you're right. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, it's a sugar though, right? Thank you for, for mentioning that. Okay, so... Um, so no matter how, which activation pathway we get, uh, we get the same, the same bits that are important to, uh, again, hopefully resolve an infection. Okay, and remember all these complement proteins, they're in the blood, uh, they, they move out of that bloodstream, uh, maybe into the lymph or into the tissues when uh, it's necessary for them to do so. All right. Um, don't be afraid to read. There's just a couple pages in your book that talk about complement, and I try to be a little more specific in my learning objectives about what I want you to know there. So uh, some, sometimes you got to see things a couple different ways till it really starts to sink in a little bit.
Okay, so I, I've mentioned inflammation a few times already. Uh, it's kind of hard to uh, kind of, um, again, know what order to go in. Hopefully some of you have talked about inflammation, I know in other classes a little bit. Um, as part of your homework, there's one of those Dr. Bauman's tutorials. It's like four and a half minutes long, but it's a really great explanation of inflammation. So uh, don't skip through that. Uh, make sure that you watch that. Um, it's really good. We typically think about inflammation as being a bad thing, um, but hopefully you'll understand that uh, it actually is important to resolve infections, at least some kind of short inflammatory reaction. Uh, so some of the benefits of inflammation, it helps to bring the right kinds of cells that are gonna fight the infection to the site of either injury or infection. It's, it's absolutely necessary to have inflammation before we can start to have tissue repair. We do have some kind of injury. Uh, and what are the, there's typically, sometimes we say there's five, there's typically four things that we look for uh, as evidence that the body is having an inflammatory reaction. So you recognize these uh, redness, localized heat, pain, uh, as well as edema. Okay, also known as swelling. Okay, so you've had inflammatory reactions. Um, every, every time you maybe, my, my daughter used to go for allergy shots and you know, where she got that allergy shot, it would be red there. Um, it would feel warm to the touch. It was always a little painful and it always swelled up a little bit. Probably see those four things when you have a vaccine as well. Um, here's an example. This is a condition described as chill brains. Um, It's just when somebody has an inappropriate um, inflammatory reaction to coldness. Okay, so not like you're walking around and you're bare for the winter, but just like normal, you know, you wake up in the morning and you have this like redness. Uh, it looks painful. The, the toes are a little swelled up. Um, again, it's just kind of an inappropriate inflammatory reaction to cold temperatures. Uh, the, the cure is to move somewhere warm or wear really thick wool socks all the time. Okay, so short term inflammation, then hopefully I'll convince you that it's necessary, it's a good thing. Unfortunately, lots of times it hangs on for longer than we want it to, it becomes chronic, uh, and then, then it's bad. So what triggers an inflammatory reaction? Uh, this is why I wanted to talk about complement first, but remember those complement fragments C3A and C5A, we said that the A's you can think of as allergy, they're increasing inflammation, increasing tumor taxes. Well, those A fragments actually bind to uh, a cell that has granules. So remember our granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Uh, and one that we didn't talk about, I'll just put in parentheses here, uh, mast cells. We, we think about mast cells as uh, being important during allergic reactions, especially. Uh, but when those granulitic cells, uh, they have receptors for the C5A and the C3A. And when those complement proteins bind to it, then it causes the cell to degranulate. And what's in those granules, but compounds or molecules that refer to as inflammatory mediators. Uh, and your book lists some of those. Um, one of them that is probably the most uh, familiar uh, so such as histamine, okay? You're all familiar with, hey, you have a cold, you might take an antihistamine in order to try to cut down on kind of the, the swelling that's associated and, and texture of mucus production. Okay, so those inflammatory mediators are released from granules 
Okay, and that is going to trigger uh, the dilation of blood vessels. Uh, and that's going to impact the permeability of the blood vessels as well. So they get bigger, they get leakier, and that's going to increase the movement of, of phagocytes. and other white blood cells, and hopefully uh, bring about the resolution of the infection. Okay, so uh, we're gonna look at some, some graphics that will help explain that, um, how all that comes about. Okay, but so, um, at, when, when a patient has been injured or um, comes in contact with a pathogen, um, we see that the dilation of the blood vessel. So normally, if we look at the capillary bed, so the place where a patient's arteries kind of change into the veins, um, this is kind of how they, they normally look, okay? In response to a pathogen, Here's these little blue dots are the inflammatory mediators acting on those blood vessels, okay? And that causes the blood vessels to get to, to what we say vasodilate. Uh, now, actually, if you have some kind of traumatic injury, they, the blood vessels might constrict right to begin with just to make sure the patient doesn't bleed out. But very soon after that, with the release of those inflammatory mediators, they're going to dilate. Uh, they're going to get they're going to get bigger. Okay, and if you do a uh, uh, zoom in a little bit further uh, at what's going on, here's a blood vessel with its normal permeability. So you can say normally there is some fluid that is constantly kind of passing out of, of that blood vessel wall. Um, where does that go? Well, that usually eventually ends up as lymph. So we're gonna talk about that shortly. Uh, but you can see here's the red blood cells, um, white blood cells, like maybe this is a, a monocyte uh, circulating in the bloodstream. Remember, the heart's pumping that. So it's whizzing through very quickly. Well, what if there's inflammatory mediators present? Okay, we get the vasodilation, uh, the blood vessels getting larger, the space in between those epithelial cells uh, is getting larger. And so not only do we have uh, more fluid leaving, but we also have the migration of some kind of white blood cell, like a monocyte maybe, um, leaving uh, that blood vessel and going out into the tissues. Okay, so that's like the chemotaxis of that white blood cell. Uh, it's following the signals to where it needs to go. So this is actually an incredibly complex process of, of that white blood cell leaving uh, because first it has to slow down and stick to the sides of the blood vessel wall. We call that process margination. Okay, so the process by which white blood cells adhere to the sides of blood vessels. Um, I say complex because there's maybe eight or nine different signals that it needs to get that that is an appropriate response to take. Um, so I won't go into all that, but that just that process margination, and then when they actually leave through the blood vessel, uh, migrate through the blood vessel wall, that process is called diapodesis. So that process by which white blood cells migrate out of the blood vessel um, into the tissues. And of course, if that was a monocyte, now it would start to differentiate into either a dendritic cell or a macrophage. Uh, 
once it leaves the, the, the blood vessel. Okay, so uh, if, um, if this inflammatory reaction goes too long or the blood vessels get too leaky, okay, too much is a bad thing. And we could have a patient going into shock. Okay, uh, if the blood vessels are too leaky, the blood pressure can go way down. And then the organ, the body's organs aren't getting the oxygen that they need. Uh, and it can cause the body's organs just to start, start shutting down. Okay, so too much inflammation uh, can kill you when you go into shock. So we don't, we want to, we want to control this kind of the just right amount that is going to help get the cells where they need to go um, and not cause other damage. All right, so the, the, effect, in, the effects of inflammation, that redness and heat, again, seems like a bad thing, but that's just uh, because of the increased blood flow. Okay, so that's a good thing uh, in some ways. Um, why do we feel pain? We get uh, those inflammatory mediator, mediators act on the nerve endings. causes some pain usually, um, as well as the, the increased amounts of fluid out into the tissues can act on the nerve endings and kind of um, cause some pain. Um, what good does, does the edema, does the swelling do? Uh, if it's a bacterial pathogen, it might help dilute any of the virulence factors that it's secreting, any of those extracellular enzymes like uh, coagulase or any um, exotoxins maybe it produces or anti-phagocytic factors. Um, it can help uh, bring about clotting factors if there's some damage um, and just get, again, like I said, uh, the swelling can facilitate those macrophages or neutrophils getting to where they need to be a lot quicker. Uh, it usually lasts a long time. It gives those cells a chance to get where they need to go. Um, oftentimes we do things to try to reduce inflammation, like take anti-inflammatory medication, or maybe we ice an area to try to get that inflammation down. Uh, because it seems like it, it tends to last longer than um, maybe what's often necessary. Uh, sometimes uh, another effect of inflammation is loss of function. Okay, so depending what source you look at, that sometimes consider a hallmark of inflammation as well. Uh, another effect of inflammation can potentially be fever. And uh, when does a patient have a fever? How do we how do we get a fever? It's when certain molecules called pyrogens. So that prefix pyro, that means fever inducing. Uh, when pyrogens act on an area of the brain called the hypothalamus. Okay, so that's deep in the brain. That's our body's thermostat, basically. So when pyrogens act on the hypothalamus, that can up our body temperature a little bit. Uh, what kind of things act as pyrogens? Sometimes it's the pathogen itself. Uh, that will act directly um, on the hypothalamus. Oftentimes, the pathogen causes our immune system to release certain cytokines. We're going to talk more about what cytokines are. They're just uh, basically chemical messengers we could talk about. Uh, and then those cytokines will act as pyrogens to kind of, again, increase our body temperature. So, Fever can have some benefits. Probably the most beneficial function of fever is just to act as a measure of health. So a useful measure of health. Okay. Of course, oftentimes fever is caused by some, by some pathogen, some infectious agent. Not all the, all the time, but uh, mostly uh, and some kind of infection is causing the fever. Uh, and of course, if we have a fever, then we realize, oh, okay, uh, I've got some kind of infection. Particularly useful 
when you're caring for someone that's nonverbal or a baby. Oh, that's why the baby's screaming, they've got a fever. Okay, we need to take some steps to try to figure this out. Okay, so it's a useful measure of health. Um, it does act somewhat to stimulate um, some aspects of our immune system. Okay, so higher temperatures, faster reactions. Okay, um, kind of it can increase phagocyte activity, it can increase the migration of immune cells where they need to go. That's probably, um, you know, uh, a helpful uh, function of, of fever. Uh, sometimes we talk about how those higher temperatures will inhibit pathogen growth. Um, to, to some extent, maybe, maybe a little bit. Um, if you, if your body temperature just goes up, goes up a couple of degrees, most bacteria, you know, they can live in quite a range of temperatures. So that doesn't really slow down most bacteria. Uh, if you remember in lab, we, we exposed cells to a 50 degree Celsius water bath for a good, good period of time, 15 minutes, I think a lot of us did, um, at least. And that didn't really affect most of our pathogens. 50 degrees Celsius is 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So, right, our fever never goes up that high. Um, there is one notable exception there. The pathogen that causes syphilis is very sensitive to temperature increases. So the way we used to cure syphilis before we had antibiotics was to also give the patient malaria, okay? Kind of a mild form of malaria that would cause the patient's temperature to go really high. Um, and then we would give them drugs to get rid of the malaria once that killed the bacteria that caused syphilis. So. There's some exceptions to that, but maybe it might slow down the growth of the pathogen a little bit. Um, it does signal our cells to take up any available iron. So it can impede nutrients availability. Okay, especially iron is a limiting nutrient for a lot of bacteria in particular. So this kind of that fever is a signal to our cells to take up any iron so it's not available for a pathogen. Okay, so there are useful functions of fever. Uh, the question that always is debated is, well, if you have a fever, maybe 99 or 100, should you treat the fever to get rid of it? Or are these benefits going to help resolve the infection sooner if you don't if you don't bring down the fever, just let the fever go. Um, and that will continue to be debated. Certainly if a patient has a high fever, 102, 103, 104, you wanna get rid of it because you know, that occasionally can cause you know, neurological things like um, things that we don't want. So we wanna bring the fever down. But uh, generally what I, from what I've read is that you shouldn't be afraid to treat the fever. Like, go ahead and treat it, go ahead and take the Tylenol. The discomfort that a fever causes is really not balanced out by these useful things, okay? So even if you take the Tylenol to get rid of the fever, it's not gonna make your infection go longer because you did that, okay? So that's, you know, to sum up a, a number of articles that I've read, of course, people will argue about it, but, okay. Uh, all right, so questions. Um, just I don't think I posted this, but kind of looking back at our outline of uh, covering innate immunity, we covered almost everything now. We need to kind of circle back here and just take a few minutes to talk about cytokines in general. Uh, and there's one in particular that I want to kind of uh, talk about the function of. Uh, and at that point, we'll be done with our chapter 15 in innate immunity. Okay, so I've mentioned, uh, this is a very wordy slide and I uh, apologize for that, um, but I kind of just want to talk about cytokines in general and mostly just recognize the kinds of molecules that are cytokines. So 
Uh, not too much really specific information here. Uh, but cytokines, like I mentioned a little bit ago, they are uh, basically messenger, messengers, okay? So chemical signaling uh, that one kind of cell will send to another, um, mostly signaling some other things like regulating growth and helping to activate lymphocytes. We're gonna talk about that more, how B cells and T cells get activated. Um, that involves cytokine signaling. So we used to call these interleukins. Uh, and there's about 36 different in interleukins, IL-1, IL-2, IL-3, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we started to realize though that th some of these signals didn't just act between white blood cells, uh, leukins meaning white blood cells, between white blood cells, but they acted on other different kinds of cells as well. So we decided maybe that wasn't the greatest term for this. So that's when we switched to talking about cytokines in general and just interleukins are a kind of cytokine. cytokine. Um, but we, we're gonna mention um, IL, IL, some different IL molecules Later on, um, just know that they're cytokines and you don't need to get any more specific than that for me. If you go on to take immunology, you might need to memorize some of the functions, but they have a lot of overlap in function. Um, another one, tumor necrosis factor, TNF. Uh, I, just, I'll just, I just want you to understand that that is a cytokine. Um, that one makes the news every once in a while, or you might hear about drugs that are tumor necrosis factor blockers from time to time. Um, when this was discovered, this was discovered in mice and uh, they realized that uh, it was a cytokine that would actually um, cause the death of tumor cells in mice. And when they isolated it from mice and tried to use it to treat cancer in humans, it didn't work out very well because it caused such a galloping inflammation that patients went into shock and were, you know, at death's door. So they're like, okay, we can't, we can't use it to treat cancer. Um, but a lot of autoimmune disease, uh, the people produce too much tumor necrosis factor. So drugs like Humira, you may have heard of that one, is actually a tumor necrosis factor blocker. Uh, it's used to treat things like rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease. Um, of course, uh, in COVID too, sometimes people uh, have too much of an immune response. So they might have to give drugs to block certain cytokines to help treat COVID even, right? Um, and the last one uh, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more specifically are interferons, okay? So this is a type of cytokine. There's two different, well, at least, depending on how you count it, two different kinds of interferons. Um, we're going to talk about interferon alpha and beta because they are really the innate system's best fight against viral infections. Um, there is a totally different kind of interferon called interferon gamma that it works primarily with our uh, parts of our adaptive immune system, and we're not really going to explore that anymore, at least for now. Okay, so uh, let me talk, let me, let me, again, come back to this interferon alpha and beta. Your book has a nice graphic to kind of uh, basically understand uh, what's going on here. Um, so say uh, you have one of our cells that becomes infected with a virus. Okay. Um, and remember what viruses do, they take over the host cell, they um, start making their own nucleic acid, they, they take over the ribosomes, make their own proteins. But when our, one of our infected cells senses that it's infected with a virus, it will start translating um, interferon, alpha and gamma. Uh, and, and primarily what that interferon, alpha and gamma does is it's secreted and acts on neighboring cells. So apparently there is some way that that interferon may help that host cell. Uh, I don't really know the mechanism by what that happens, but primarily it acts on neighboring cells that have receptors for interferon. And it causes those neighboring cells to translate these inactive 
antiviral proteins, AVPs. Okay, and like I said, they're, they're inactive at that point, but they're ready if they're, they uh, are necessary. Okay, so over time, time passes, this infected cell, nothing can be done for it. It's infected with the virus, it's gonna die. Okay, but um, the, that neighboring cell, if at some later time, now this cell lyses and now it, those viruses are, uh, going to infect that neighboring cell. When that cell is infected with the virus, those antiviral proteins become active. And so what they're doing, they're binding to that, uh, that viral RNA that's being made. Uh, so this ribosomal messenger RNA, it's, it's binding to that RNA and helps to degrade it. Um, as well as those antiviral proteins um, bind to the host ribosomes so that no new proteins can be translated. So you would think that would be bad for this cell if it couldn't make proteins, but it can survive for three or four days without making any new proteins. Um, and that's going to serve to uh, slow the replication of the virus. Okay, so um, it may or may not be able to kill the virus by degrading that nucleic acid, but, it, but for sure, at least it's gonna slow down the replication, uh, you know, by a few days and, you know, give our adaptive immune system a chance to kind of recognize that invader, okay? Now, the downside is, uh, downside is that interferon, whoops, in let me spell that right, interferon, um, it also causes some of the effects that we associate with viral infection, okay? So it causes some things like uh, malaise, which just means kind of a tiredness that you might associate, say if you have a cold or something, uh, achiness, okay? Those may not be effects of the virus itself, but from the interferon that our cells secrete in order to try to slow down the spread of that virus. So uh, two things that we associate with viral infections, kind of a tiredness, um, kind of an achiness, that, that's due to the interferon, okay? So uh, to kind of wrap up here, there's a nice little table in your book that kind of summarizes some of the, the components of that innate immune system. So, Again, that's good to study from, to kind of cover up and quiz yourself and see if you kind of get the gist of what's going on there, okay? Don't forget the big picture when you're studying the details, okay? Questions about innate immunity, comments? All right, so you can be working on that chapter 15 homework. Um, I think it's probably a little bit longer than what some of the other assignments have been. Chapter 16 is also a long one. Okay, so again, I don't think I posted this. This just goes back to, you know, kind of our, how we're approaching this. We've got through our first and second line. So now we're ready to jump into um, our adaptive immunity, okay? So specifically, we're gonna be looking at um, the work of B and T cells uh, and just kind of a few things moving forward that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, we've gotta talk about kind of where some of these reactions take place in the lymphatic system. So we'll kind of review the players that are important there. Um, we're finally gonna, Define the term antigen and talk about which kind of molecules are good antigens, as well as what our body makes in response to antigens, and that those are called antibodies. So different, uh, different, uh, uh, for, different forms of antibody and what the, those antibodies actually do to help us. Um, 
And then I probably won't get this to this today, but uh, a cell that's infected with a virus, like that's, that's inside of the cell. How does our immune system notice that that cell has been infected? Well, we have ways to actually advertise that our cells are infected with virus. So um, we'll get into that. Those are with uh, something called MHC glycoproteins. Uh, and that's important in order to activate our B cells and T cells uh, in order to hopefully bring about a resolution of that infection. So that's where we're going with this. Um, I would encourage you, if you haven't read your book, to start reading your book, the chapter 16. Um, I, I probably will at times present things in a little different order, uh, but that's okay. Again, the more times you see something, you really need to see this a few times before it really starts to sink in. So, um, plan to maybe spend a little extra time with that if possible. All right, so we talked a little bit a couple of lectures ago about what's the difference between innate and adaptive immunity. Um, adaptive immunity is uh, a really very specific response to specific pathogens. Okay, so five ways that we describe adaptive immunity. Um, first thing, specificity. Okay, we're not talking about broad-based patterns like, you know, LPS and peptidoglycan. Uh, we're talking about really, really specific shapes and patterns that we have B cell receptors and T cell receptors that we'll recognize, okay? Um, and we may only have a couple of these, sorry, I don't know why that's so shaky. I don't, something with the building. Um, we only, we had now have a few B cells or T cell with receptors that, that fit a specific pathogen. But you probably have a couple of cells, B cells or T cells that would uh, match up with stingray venom, for example. All right, we don't need a bunch of cells that recognize that because we're not likely to encounter it. But if we do encounter it, then those few cells that, that recognize it are going to be induced or, or activated. So inducibility, okay, those, those cells that recognize stingray venom would, would get activated uh, and then they would act and then they would make more of themselves. So we call that attribute clonality. Okay, once activated, they're gonna make a lot more of themselves. Um, if everything's working the way it should, uh, our cells of our adaptive immunity should be unresponsive to self. And I thought maybe that one didn't need any further clarification, but um, again, if everything's working right, then our, we shouldn't be making antibodies to our own our own cells. Um, and, but sometimes whether it's in response to some environmental factor or a genetic predisposition, something goes wrong. And then we have autoimmune disease. Um, and then of course, uh, we can't forget the hallmark memory. Okay, that's the, the big advantage to our adaptive immune response is that the second time that same pathogen is encountered, we have a much faster and a much better response. So that hopefully, you know, the second time you may not even know that you've been exposed to that pathogen because you don't get sick at all. Okay, so uh, that memory, that's, that's a big difference between the innate response and the adaptive response. Okay. So um, we've mentioned B cells and T cells. Of course, those are two major kinds of lymphocytes that we'll be spending the most time on. Natural killer cells are lymphocytes too, but we just don't uh, bother with them very much. Uh, the B cells are important to generate the antibody immune response. So we're gonna talk much more about that. Uh, we often refer to that as our humoral response, our body's humors, fluids, things like blood and lymph, mucous membranes, secretions that we have. Um, and they are gonna be primarily 
uh, necessary to act on extracellular pathogens. Okay, um, so by an extracellular pathogen, I mean that one that came from outside of our body. Okay, so entered by some portal of entry, maybe we swallowed it, for example, or breathed it in. Okay, so it's, it's out, started outside of our body. Um, and then T cells, uh, we mentioned this before, we uh, refer to their work as uh, cell mediated immune response. We have a couple different kinds of T cells that we'll talk about. Uh, and they are most necessary to act on intracellular pathogens. So some microbe that is actually hiding out inside of our cell. So that could be a bacteria. There are some bacteria like chlamydia that have to uh, live inside of our cells to reproduce, but all the viruses, Okay, they start out as extracellular pathogens, but then when they gain access to our cells, then they become intracellular pathogens. So um, really antibodies are, are really only helpful in fighting viruses when those, before those viruses gain entry to our cells. Okay. So I think it's important to think about first where, where these B cells and T cells are uh, and where they're working. So uh, a little, hopefully it's a little bit of a review of the lymphatic system. Um, bear with me, I have never had an anatomy course in my life, so a lot of you are more experts on this than I am. Uh, but of course, the lymphatic system is our mechanism to uh, carry lymph around uh, our bodies. And lymph is very similar in constitution to blood plasma. So the kind of watery part of our blood. Um, so lymph is, you know, it's kind of water, proteins, lots of cells, lots of B cells and T cells traveling through um, our lymph. Uh, and I also want to mention some specialized tissues that are going to be necessary to carry that, that lymph around. Okay, so um, I also want to mention that pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about is actually more complicated than what I say it is. <laughs> so keep that in mind. We're trying to get kind of the basics across. And then, you know, if you study this in any more depth, you would realize, oh, but there's an exception to that. And oh, it actually works on these other cells and all that. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind. We're trying to we're trying to figure out which basics are kind of most important. Um, but the primary lymphoid organs, that's pretty much where lymphocytes are made. So the big one is red bone marrow. Okay, so not all of our bones contain red bone marrow, mostly our flat bones like uh, pelvic bone, uh, humerus sternum, uh, a little bit in our skull actually as well, has, has red bone marrow. Um, and there are stem cells in that red bone marrow that are going to eventually mature into lymphocytes. Okay, so this is where uh, B cells are uh, made, T cells are made, and uh, some B and T cells are also made in the spleen and the liver, but uh, let's focus on the red bone marrow uh, here. Uh, and this is also where uh, B cells are going to mature. So um, what do I mean by mature? Um, it, it, it's, it's a process of B cells learning what kind of cells that they need to, um, that they need to recognize, okay? So uh, they get, that, that's part of what, we're not gonna really go into too much more detail, but we wanna make sure that we don't have B cells that recognize our own tissues that are normally there. So we wanna get rid of all those B cells 
that have a B cell receptor that would recognize cell. Okay, uh, the other primary lymphoid organ uh, is the thymus. So this is a small gland near the heart. Uh, most of the work that the thymus does happens before we're born. And then that organ shrinks and shrinks and becomes less important as we age. Uh, but this is where T cells mature. Okay, so where T cells differentiate into the different kinds of T cells and where the T cell cells with T cell receptors that would recognize cell hopefully uh, die by uh, a programmed cell death. Okay, so those are the primary, primary lymphoid organs, red bone marrow and the thymus. Uh, and then in the secondary lymphoid organs, that's where lymphocytes are activated. So where the B and T cells come in contact with parts of pathogens that we call antigens um, that will, will stimulate them to, to actually act, okay? So this is primarily happening in lymph nodes. We have somewhere between 500 and 700 lymph nodes in our body. They are congested, especially in the neck, armpit, and groin area. Uh, and they have kind of a kind of a tough outer covering to them. Um, and they're about the size of a pea. Okay, so they're, they're quite small, most of them. Uh, you know, we can have some of them removed and it doesn't, uh, doesn't cause us any problem. Uh, but in the lymph nodes, that's where the filtering of the lymph takes place, um, where the B cells and the T cells, again, are coming into contact with the, the pathogens that they need to uh, fight against. Uh, the spleen is an organ that performs a uh, very similar function to lymph nodes, except the spleen is filtering blood. Okay. Um, and then the tonsils are, are basically a, just kind of a, a kind of lymph node. Um, obviously, we can do quite nicely without the tonsils. Some people, they're quite large and, uh, you know, bacteria tend to get caught in the folds and people are better off without them. Uh, you can do without your spleen as well. Sometimes uh, if people are in an accident and that spleen gets ruptured, can't just sew it up, apparently it has to be removed so patients don't bleed out. Um, but if somebody doesn't have a spleen, they're gonna be a little bit more susceptible to especially bacterial infections. So they may need to take antibiotics prophylactically or they may be, have to take longer courses of antibiotics. Uh, they definitely need more vaccines to try to uh, give them a little extra protection if they don't have a spleen. Um, and then there's a, uh, one more kind of lymphat secondary lymphoid tissue that maybe is not as uh, recognizable, but we call it the MALT, uh, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. So this is tissues that are Acting as lymph nodes, they just don't have that tough outer covering that the lymph nodes uh, have. So you can find these in all of our mucosal membranes. Uh, this particular one, Peyer's patches, uh, you can see that right here. Um, that's especially important to those, that's lymphoid tissue that kind of samples what's moving through our small intestine. Um, so it's checking the small intestine for any pathogens from things that we've eaten, okay? So again, this is uh, testing, okay. associated again with intestine. Okay, so that's a little overview of our lymphatic system. Okay, so if we look a little bit closer at a lymphoid capillary uh, and its association with the blood capillary. So of course uh, the blood is pumped by the heart, right? That's how it circulates through the body. Um, normally we have, you know, a small amount of fluid uh, leaving that bloodstream. We've got gases, uh, maybe some proteins, uh, some nutrients maybe that are getting out to the tissue. So normally we have some stuff leaving that blood vessel, um, kind of whatever's left over, um, as long as 
the blood pressure in the lymphatic capillary is less than the blood pressure in the tissues, um, kind of that leftover stuff will enter into the lymphatic capillary, be collected. Okay, and there are valves here. It's kind of hard to see it like here and here to ensure that that lymph only moves in one direction. And it doesn't move very quickly. We don't have a lymph pump, right? We just have smooth muscle, muscle contraction to help kind of move that lymph along. To some extent, uh, apparently moving your skeletal muscle, muscles helps move the lymph as well. So good to exercise if you want to keep your lymph moving. Uh, and that moves in one direction towards the heart. And that lymph actually dumps back into the bloodstream uh, at the point in our body where our blood pressure is the lowest. Okay, and that's it, the subclavian vein, which is somewhere near our heart. Okay, uh, two hearts to that subclavian vein. Oops. Okay, near the heart. Okay, so basically those cells that are circulating in the lymph, they're kind of going back and forth from the blood to the lymph in the normal circumstances. And that lymph that's traveling in the lymphoid capillaries eventually will come to a lymph node. Okay, like I said, we have at least 500 of these in our body. Um, and the design of the lymph node, you can see there's four different afferent lymphatic vessels. So in, I don't know if that's the same for every lymph node, but there's always gonna be more vessels coming into the lymph node than there are leaving, okay? So this prefix A means towards, and the efferent lymphatic vessels, vessels there's two of them, um, that E means away, okay? So, by design, we have more coming into the lymph node than we have leaving it. So that's gonna create a bottleneck, okay? You want that lymph to circulate in that lymph node because the cells that are traveling maybe have macrophages and dendritic cells that have ingested some pathogen and are displaying on the surface, presenting parts of those pathogens that they need to come in contact with the right B or T cell that has the right receptor for those pathogens. So they need to time to kind of mingle with the cells there to find uh, a B or T cell with the right uh, rece uh, receptor, okay? Um, oftentimes when we're sick and we go to the doctor, the doctor will feel uh, our throat here to see if our lymph nodes are swelled up. Usually when our lymph nodes swell up, that's a sign of infection. Okay, more fluid uh, traveling in the lymph because of you know, inflammation, more cells, it just causes the lymph nodes to swell up. Okay. All right, um, so that term antigen. All right, let's, let's be square. I, I try not to use that term until uh, I define it but uh, we'll have to kind of get a few things straight before uh, we move forward. So an antigen, uh, let's define that as a molecule, the body uh, recognizes as foreign. Um, and I've had people say to me, oh, I get mixed up antigen and antibody. What's the good thing and what's the bad thing? Well, antigens, they call them that because they're antibody generators, okay? So we make antibody in response to antigen, the path parts of pathogens, okay? So things that act as antigens, uh, various bacterial components or other kinds of microbe like fungi, protozoa, um, things that are not pathogens can also act as antigens. So, you know, you may have a shellfish allergy, okay? Uh, that something in that shellfish 
uh, is acting to elicit uh, an inappropriate immune response. Um, a lot of people are allergic to dust or you know, whatever it is in dust that, that causes uh, an allergic reaction. So there are things other than pathogens that for some people can be antigenic. Um, and the parts of antigen that our immune system actually recognizes, uh, we call that the epitope. Okay, so the regions of antigens that are recognized. Um, okay, we could say we could say by um, we'll just say our immune system. We'll keep it general at not right now. Okay, sometimes. I'll say AKA, also known as antigenic determinants. I don't usually use that term, antigenic determinants. I usually call them epitopes. Uh, what's the difference between an epitope and an antigen? Well, if we might refer to as some bacteria uh, as an antigen. But then there's all different sites on that bacteria that maybe an antibody might recognize. So there's lots of different epitopes, again, that maybe a different antibody or a B cell receptor, a T cell receptor might recognize. Okay, so the more epitopes that an antigen has, the more likely our immune system is going to have a good response. Okay, with COVID-19, you hear again and again talk about these spike proteins. Okay, why do we make so much fuss about that? Well, that's the only outside part of the virus that our immune system recognizes, so spike proteins. So, uh, you know, for a while, that was uh, what everybody was talking about. Okay, so what makes a good antigen? What I mean by that is, why does a molecule, what is it about a molecule that makes it elicit a really good, strong immune response? Um, we look at several things. We look at the shape, or to me, what goes in hand in hand with that is the complexity of the molecule. Okay, if it has a really distinct 3D shape, um, if it's complicated molecule, then it's going to have a lot of epitopes and likely be recognized by our immune system. Also, an important attribute of a molecule is its size. The bigger something is, the more likely our immune system is going to recognize it. So things that are really small, for instance, less than 500 Daltons, uh, are usually aren't recognized at all. They just kind of slip through. Now, there's an exception to that uh, because something like uh, poison ivy oil, the molecule in poison ivy oil that causes us to have the rash and the itching is called urochiol. Uro I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but urochiol, I think. And that molecule is so small that our immune system doesn't recognize it. But we all know that for a lot of us, it does. So what happens that urochiol actually acts as a haptin. In other words, it, it complexes up with some larger carrier protein and then our immune system is able to recognize it. So that poison ivy oil, when it, when it penetrates into our skin a little bit, it complexes with proteins in our skin. So that's why if you can wash it off before it, soaks in a little bit, then you won't have a reaction. Uh, not just scrubbing it with soap, but because it's an oil, you have to scrub it like with a rag or something too to get it off so it doesn't sink in. Uh, but again, it acts as a haptin, it complexes with a larger protein, and then our immune system recognizes it and we have a, uh, I think it's a delayed hypersensitivity reaction is what it's referred to, but okay. Uh, so what kind of molecules are good antigens? Uh, proteins are usually the best antigens because uh, here's an example. I just pulled out a picture of beta-galactosidase. That's the enzyme that's like lactose. 
you just look at that protein, it's it's complicated, uh, complicated shape, um, very complex. Uh, so our, our immune system tends to recognize proteins the best, oh, the spike protein uh, or coronavirus. Um, if a molecule is kind of part lipid, part protein, or part sugar, part protein, that's more kind of mid-range, you know, somewhat of a response. Usually, polysaccharides don't generate a very good immune response because they're often just repeating. So here's starch, glucose, 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 glucose. It's not complicated. It's just kind of the same molecule over and over again. Um, there are exceptions to this. There certainly are polysaccharides that are antigenic, uh, but sort of as a general rule, usually, usually proteins make the best antigens. Okay, so a, a little more terminology to do with antigens. Um, ones that are exogenous, and that's a term that we used uh, a little bit earlier. Um, exogenous antigens, they enter the body from the outside. So I think I used the term exogenous pathogen, right? Enters the body from the outside through some portal of entry. Um, and then an endogenous antigen. Okay, they are um, produced within the cell or exist within the cell. So, like I said, viruses would start out as an exogenous antigen once they enter our cell, then they're considered endogenous. Um, autoantigens. Auto meaning self. Self antigens. Uh, they are kind of the proteins, especially that you normally have. Uh, and again, under normal immune tolerance, that they don't elicit any immune response. Like they should be ignored by our immune cells. Okay, that and and when they're not, then we could have an autoimmune disease. Like here's somebody that has rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, they uh, have immune cells that are targeting the, the joints there. Uh, very, very painful. Okay. Uh, and then one that your book doesn't talk about, um, but I want to mention here because we're going to mention a couple infections later on, uh, super antigens. These are antigens made by pathogens that cause a totally inappropriate over-the-top immune response. Okay, so if you've ever heard of toxic shock syndrome, toxin, that's actually a super antigen. It can cause a patient have such uncontrolled inflammation that they go into shock. Um, and this is not from your book, and this gets ahead of ourselves just a little bit, um, but I think it's a good um, kind of preamble to what we'll be talking about later. Um, in a classical T cell activation, um, we have some kind of antigen that's in black there that gets presented by, say, a macrophage to a T cell, okay? It's recognized by a T cell receptor. Okay, normally you might have a couple of T cells that recognize that specific antigen. But if that antigen is a super antigen, then we get as many as like 20% of our total T cell population that recognize that antigen. So we get tons of, of cytokine production, uh, and again, just kind of way too much inflammation, more than what our, our body can handle. So that causes a lot of problems when it's have that non-specific activation. Okay, so uh, here's your book, little graphic, just kind of uh, to kind of draw out the different antigens. An exogenous antigen could be, you know, some kind of bacteria or a virus when it's outside of the cell. And then endogenous antigen maybe is a is one of our cells with a virus inside it. These little things on the outside, our body has a way to advertise what's going on inside of it. And we'll get to that hopefully next time. Uh, it's presenting parts of, of that virus. So our immune cell can notice that that cell has been infected by a virus. Uh, and then of course, autoantigens, 
thankfully are ignored and our, our immune response, we don't have one to it. We want to just ignore them. All right, so that's a good place to stop. We'll pick up with uh, B cells for next time. And I hope you have a good day.